All right. Welcome back, everybody. We still make our way through the book of Psalms, slowly but surely, one at a time. At our current rate, it'll still be two years before we finish. <laughs> um, made no comment of it, but uh, uh, last week we entered the 30s in Psalms. Um, and we discussed the first of those 30s, Psalm 30. Uh, does anybody remember what we discussed in the previous lesson? Mm-hmm. Extolation. He extolled. Even by even by biblical stand, standards, the word extol is not used ex, in, 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 to an extreme fashion, but it's just like praise of the highest manner. Um, Brother Jared, did I see your hand up, or was that you scratching your ear? <laughs> That's right. And then, Brother Larry, I believe I saw your hand up at one point. Yeah, it seemed like the theme of the psalm was I can praise you more if I'm civil. Well, yeah, it's it, he did. Um, verse 9 says, What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be thou my helper. Although, not necessarily the theme of, of, the, uh, of the chapter. It was a portion of it. Let's, let's not to the extent that all things are done through God and for His glory, and that it's bad when someone comes up and puffs your head up and says, "Hey, great job you did there. Keep that mm-hmm. blessing or whatever." It's really for God's glory. Yeah, the say glory to God for it. the the thrust of this is especially the thrust of the chapter says, "In my prosperity, I said, I said, I shall never be moved." Lord, by thy, 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 by thy favor hast thou made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hidest thy face, and I was troubled. It, the uplifting yourself in the work of the Lord um, is, is probably the reason that David was in trouble in this specific chapter, was he established and... and, and I, I'd read nothing to this to this effect, although you know a lot of the psalms are not necessarily attached to specific events in David's life. But I mean, David was caught up in in that. Uh, at one point, things were going so good, he said, "You know what? Even though God said not to, I'm going to number the people. Let's just see how that goes for ourselves." And and, and it, it did not turn out super hot for everybody. Um, uh, so uh, that concludes our look at Psalm 30, and we venture forth to Psalm 31, which is 24 verses, so we're going to try to make this as, as quick and as painless as possible. Uh, the first verse says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my rock for a house of defense to save me. Uh, the first verse starts out honestly quite similar to the start of the last chapter. And this chapter, although there are different sources that think this took place in different times, even some people think this took place in his run from Absalom. I think we've kind of concluded that that area. But some people also said this may have been in his in, in his time when he's being persecuted by Saul. Um, but um, David. David learned a lot of things in his in his persecutions and his running, and he said he says here, do, do, uh, "In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust? Let me never be ashamed." Now, David wasn't worried about being ashamed of God. Now, I think that's something that we we worry about quite a bit um, uh, when we're around people and talk to people and and, and say things. He said, "Well, I don't want to I don't want to get too religious in this situation. That might uh, 
might offend this person. And, and, but I don't think that's the type of ashamed that David was talking about here. David, um, David and, he, and he goes on later in this chapter, I think it's a little bit clearer later on in this chapter when he basically reiterates this point again, is that he did not want to pray to God and let everybody know that he was praying to God for deliverance, and then God not show up and help him. Let him don't let me be um, ashamed in that that I, you know that I look 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 the fool for uh, for coming to you for aid. And 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 he says he, he starts it off saying, "And Lord, in Thee do I put my trust." But also, I'm trusting you. But also, please don't make me look like an idiot here for putting my trust. In you, I, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna lay it all out on the table, and I'm going to trust that when when all the when all the pieces fall into place, that they will they will work out positively positively for me and negatively for my enemies. Uh, he says uh, um, uh, to uh, bow down thine ear uh, and deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for a house of defense to save me. David was wanting a castle. A house of defense, a place, and, and not just any house of defense, a house of defense built upon a rock. Now, this type of language is, is used throughout the scripture, but I think whenever you talk about someone building a house upon a rock, you're immediately called to, to the New Testament and to the parable that was told about a, a wise man built it, building a house upon a rock and a foolish man building a house upon a sand. And why do we build upon a rock? Because that rock, of course, being a, a, a semblance of the, uh, a, 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 a example of the uh, steadfast and surety of our Lord and Savior. And, uh, and and the defenses and places that 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 that, come, that arise from that 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 arise that arise from that area, this mountain, for uh, for which we can seek refuge. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. He re, he re, reiterates here that um, not only does he want to be defended, he lays claim to it. You are my rock. You are my fortress. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I've I made a couple of weeks ago. I made the the uh, the the uh, comment that I don't whip Brother Lolly's kids because they're not my kids. In the very same same manner, though, Brother Lolly's kids don't come to me for aid. Now, if Brother Lolly wasn't around and there was nobody else there to help them, they might. I, I think Edsel's a little scared of me. Every time I look at him, his face screws up. But, uh, but, but in, in a situation where no other adult was present and they needed help, they might come to me. But most often than not, where everybody is here and maybe they don't know everybody really well, they're going to go to who for help? They're going to go to Brother Lolly for help because they're his children. And, and why is that? That, that's, that? Even if they can't verbalize it, even if they don't understand it uh, on, a, on an intellectual level, on a very instinctual level, they know that's my father. And it's safe with him. AJ, with, with, with all the, 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 the problems that he has, he is very defensive when he first gets around a whole bunch of people. And who does he cling to? He clings to his mother and his father. Why? Because he knows there's safety there because there were his people. And David not only makes the claim that I want to have a rock, I want to have a fortress, he's saying you are mine. And, and that lay, laying of claim is as much part of the Lord's power as it is us. We, we, we have the right, and I know that sometimes we like to look at ourselves as, as super lowly, but there are things within Scripture that allow us as God's people, if you're a saved person and you're one of His, to lay claim to some stuff. Because you are one of His, you are, and I hate to use this word because it gets used so bad, but you are entitled to certain benefits as one of God's people. Pull me out of the net that they lay privily for me, for thou art my strength. Into thine hand I commend my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Now the first verse there says, uh, pull me out of the net that they lay privily for me. Oh boy, do we fall into some very... Uh, sometimes very obvious nets. Have you ever ever seen a trap laid? Sometimes uh, uh, Vietnam was full of them. Uh, uh, Guerrilla uh, uh, warfare and stuff that they had over there. They were very good at it. But I, I've, I've I've seen traps laid before. And uh, think of a mouse trap, for instance. Mouse traps. 
for whatever reason, mice don't understand that one day they're having to scrounge around and look for crumbs, and all of a sudden there is a an object there that is offering them cheese if they will just if they will just but run up to it, and and and, and they don't even realize that this newly placed object is 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 a danger to them. And I think we're the same way. A lot of times we we look at traps and we're like. Yeah, that's evidently a trap. Uh, it is definitely offering something tantalizing, though, and I'm not going to use my spiritual brain. I'm going to use my physical one, and I'm going to reach out for the treat. And where do we find ourselves? Snap. We're captured. Verse 5, I do want to point out, is are a reference to our Lord's cries on the cross. Into thy hand I commend my spirit. It is finished. Is, is, is what our Lord said. And he was quoting um, from, from this uh, book of Psalms. David also, again, placing trust. We already referred to trust at the early part of the chapter, but again, he's putting, he says, you've redeemed me. This is more of that ownership. You're the one, you're the one in charge. You're mine. And so I am putting my trust into you. You've never failed me before. You've saved my soul I'm going to put that, that in it. I have hated them that regard lying vanity, but I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble. Thou, ha thou hast known my soul in adversities. Thou hast not shut me up into the hand of the enemy. Thou hast set my feet in a large room. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Mine eye is consumed with grief, yea, my soul and my belly, for my life is spent with grief and my years with singing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity, and my bones are consumed. Now, we read a longer st uh, stint there. First of all, he says he hates those with lying vanities. Uh, that's a reference to our trap. Other people are, will flatter you. They will... They will, they will place big fat compliments on you and then look, look to you to follow them into, you know, you've, you've seen the, you know, uh, uh, heard stories about children being lured by predators with, with, with candy and whatnot. Those are just, those are all lies. And, 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 and once they enter that situation, they realize how untruthful this nice person with free candy is, you know, is, 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 all, is, is that is bringing to them. And spiritually and physically, we can say, "Oh yeah, yeah, the, the, you know, we, we have wisdom. We can, we can, we can see this." But spiritually, we're just so we, we so easily just just take everything at face value. They just must be, you know, being nice to me just to be nice to me. I, I, I promise you, there's no fr there's no person in the world that is your friend, and that has your best interest in 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 their heart. Now they may think they do. But fleshly people go after fleshly things, and they want you to follow them into fleshly things because it's all they know. They have no knowledge of anything else. And they may think, well, you know, I'm just inviting him out for a beer. That's a very friendly, by the world standards, it's a very friendly thing to do, is it not? To, 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 to sup and to, sh and to share a, a meal and, and, a, and a drink with someone, to have a good time, to, 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 to shoot the breeze with somebody, that's a very friendly thing to offer. But the Bible says that wine is a mocker. And most often it doesn't stop. And I'm not necessarily against alcohol. This is not my, my non-alcoholic message. Uh, because the Bible's, uh, Jesus didn't turn that water into grape juice, people. He turned it into wine. And they had wine at the, at the, at the wedding in Cana, Galilee. But one beer does not, usually does not stop there. It goes on. And the Bible also says that wine is a mocker. And it can make you do stupid things and get involved in, 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 in actions that you shouldn't be involved with. And that thing that seemed like a friendly invitation is a lying vanity that is weighing in a trap for you to fall into. Further down, um, said that, I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble. David wasn't looking for immediate help. He was just glad that the Lord had heard him. Who in here has interacted with some type of customer support before? I am venture to say all of us. Would you be real, real satisfied if when you got on the phone with a customer service representative and they said, yeah, I understand where you're coming from and have a nice day. <laughs> I'll get right on that. Have a nice day. 
maybe you're happy with that. If you are, you're probably a bigger person than me because when I want a situation taken care of, I want it taken care of right now. When I, when I had, before we had, when we had Mediacom, without a doubt, one of the worst internet companies out there, and their customer service is probably some of the worst that I ever fooled with before, I, I would sometimes just scream and say, you, you know, you're going to come out, and, and, and I know the person on the other line couldn't do anything, but you're going to come out and fix it right now. I'm paying $200 a month for nothing. Actually nothing. Took me nine months for them to come out and get anything done. That's another story another, uh, for another time. But they, uh, but David was looking at this situation. He went to the Lord. He said, Lord, I need help. And the Lord says, I hear you. Whenever I, can, whenever I want to do something, whenever I'm done considering it, whenever it's my time, I'll do something about it. And David was happy about it. I've made many times the example about when we ask the Lord for something, it's like one of your children asking you for something. I can tell you from firsthand knowledge, and these two may be some of the worst in the world about this, when they ask for something and you don't get it for them immediately. They're very upset by that. You're never going to get it for me. Yeah, that, because history has shown that when you're thirsty, I just let you thirst to death. That, that, that's how that works. That, that, no. That's not at all. I'm busy right now. I've got other things occupying my attention. Maybe I'm holding a pan of hot grease, and I'm sorry I can't get apple juice right now. But there are dangers and situations outside of your control that I must attend to before I get to what little piddling problem you have. And unlike our children, and unlike us when we're with customer service representatives, David looked at the Lord just having considered it as a blessing in and of itself and knew that because he trusted and because he was patient and because in the past, and he actually referenced this, references some of this in these verses, in the past the Lord had done stuff to help him in other adversities, that the Lord was going to take care of it. That, 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 that it may not be right now, but he was going to do something about it. Um, he says, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Mine eye is consumed with grief, yea, my, my soul and my belly. For my life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of my iniquity, and my bones are consumed. David was looking at a deterioration of the flesh, not just simply from, sick, from illness, but from time. Time is in an adversity that we will never overcome in the flesh. Brother Lolly is not significantly younger than me, but definitely younger than me. And I am probably more tired and whatnot than he is on a daily basis, although from some of his experiences recently, he's probably pretty tired. Um, but I am more tired than him, and I've got a father who's 20-plus years older than me, and he's more tired than me, and I've got a grandfather sitting over there who's 50-plus who's 50 years, older, 50 years older than me, and he's more tired than I am, and he's more tired than Brother Larry is. Time does not allow us to come at situations with the same gusto that it says, my life is spent. David was needing the strength of the Lord because physically your body will fail you. Whether by illness or by time or by, or, or by accident, something will happen to you and your body will fail you. Which is why the New Testament encourages why you're young, do the stuff for the Lord now. Because your strength is going to run out. And one day you'll be in David's situation, this very situation, for the barest minimum of your problems asking the Lord to solve them for you because you physically are incapable of doing it. The blessing is the Lord, is, despite your physical adversities, is capable of solving your problems whether you're a, whether you're a broken vessel or not. I was a reproach among my enemies, but especially among my neighbors, and a fear to my acquaintance. They, uh, they that did see me fled from me. I am forgotten as a dead man, out of mine, I am like a broken vessel. For I heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they advised to take away my life. 
People, I, this kind of stuff happens all the time to God's people, but I will advise you in a different way than I think this verse is, is talking about. Yes, you are going to have people conspire against you, even though that's not what they're going to call it. What they're going to do is they're going to talk about you behind your back. God's people do not need to be busybodies. We do not need to spend time tearing each other down. And if you're involved with that, you're sinning. Simple enough. It's as simple a fact as it can be. And I know there are things about me that annoy some of you. That There are things about me that annoy me. There are things, I'm sure, about Sister Diane that annoy some people. I can't think of any because she's the best grandmother ever. Um, but, but I'm sure there are things about you that, that annoy people. There are people, there are things about Brother Jared that I'm sure annoy people. But we don't need to take counsel together and get around behind people's back and talk about how awful these people that I've mentioned are because it doesn't do anything to uplift them. It doesn't do anything to bring the church together in further unity. It doesn't do anything. All it does is create cliques and ultimately create resentment. Resentment that festers and ultimately explodes at some point. And usually a church is lost, a member is lost, a family is lost. Somebody will leave because of because we just can't keep our mouth shut. We, 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 we seem to, as, as, as human individuals, need to come together to tear someone else down. That's clearly unsupported by Scripture. But I trusted in Thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my God. Again, trust and laying claim. I'm trusting, and because I'm trusting, and because you're mine, and I'm coming to you for help, there are certain things that you, are, that you covenanted together with us to take care of. My times are at thy hand. Deliver me from mine enemies and from them that persecute me. My times are in my hand. Again, God's on his own, his own timetable. He's, he's not concerned with how, how fast you think a problem should be solved. You know, I bet Job, one of the biggest examples of someone experiencing trials in a lifetime in the Scriptures, you'll probably find, maybe except for our Lord, um, I'm sure Job really wished the boils all over his body would stop any day now. I'm sure he really wished that his children weren't dead. I'm sure he really wished that some of his stuff would come back and his money and that, you know, these random rovering bands of Chaldeans hadn't made off with them. I'm sure he wished the tornadoes hadn't come. And I, sure, I bet he sure wished that his wife would just go away and quit telling him to curse God and die. But none of that happened. And it goes on for 30 or thirty plus chapters talking about how it did not happen. But, jo but Job persevered. At the end of that, Job receives a reward for his patience and his trust in the Lord. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Save me for thy mercy's sake. Let uh, me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I called upon, upon thee. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. Now, again, this reference to ashamed, I kind of explained it earlier, but he also says, let the, let the wicked be ashamed. <laughs> so don't let me be ashamed, as we discussed earlier, but please let the wicked feel the shame that they're feeling because they're trusting in something totally different. They're trusting in money. They're trusting in the government. They're trusting in themselves. Let lying lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has shewed me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. Now, verses 18 and 19 describe, firstly, what he hopes will be done to the people that are running around talking about him, lying lips. And then he says, Oh, how great is thy goodness for, that, for, for, for them which have... Uh, how great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. 
which hath wrought, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence. How many of us have a secret place where we could talk to the Lord? I'm not talking like uh, there's that that movie made by the same people that did Facing the Giants and whatnot about prayer. I forget what the name of it is now. It's but but they, they made an actual prayer closet, and I'm sure it, and it was an interesting movie. But uh, the, the the Bible, when it's referring to a prayer closet, is really referring to a private time in which you commune alone with God. There is secret. There 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 is safety. There is help. There is, there is power beneath the wings of our Lord. Well, Larry alluded to this heavily in his sermon, if you're paying attention to, uh, to, to, to it this morning. There is, and, and that is not going to be had, and you can, you can worship corporately. That, that, that is the point of church, is to worship corporately. But your time alone spent with God is your time. And that relationship can be as strong and as personal and as safe and the winds can sail and blow about you. I bet as long as Peter had his eyes locked on the Lord when he went walking out on the sea, he couldn't hear the sound of the wind. He couldn't feel the splash of the waves. He, he did. I don't know what walking on water would be like, but it looks awful uneven. Uh, but I bet he didn't, I didn't, I bet that his foot was just as steady and the, the more time we spend in that personal, uh, for, for lack of a better term, uh, 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 vacuum space where nothing else exists but you and God, everything else disappears. And you're granted safety and strength that you're not granted anywhere else. But that only exists for however much effort you put in. The minute that Peter takes his eyes off the Lord, what does he do? He starts to sink. Now, in the flesh, I'm sure I, I, the fact that he walked on the water any at all would have bested me. And it bested, if you ever read that passage, it bested 11 other disciples that were still in the boat. A lot of people downplay Peter because of, I mean, and he did. He made a big mistake when he denied the Lord thrice on his, at his trial. But Peter made some decisions that, bold choices that no other apostle made. He is the first one to testify that Christ was the Lord. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Not to bolster Peter up, I'm sure he doesn't need any help with that. Uh, but that came, he was one of the inner circle, and that came from personal time that he spent with the Lord. He got in that secret pavilion, that place of, of, of and, and, and if you don't spend time there, when bad times come, you are not going to find the strength necessary to survive. You will be swept away and usually swept away to further and worse things than whatever situation that you're in right now. Why? Because you're, trying, you're, you're, you're on the boat and you're trying to paddle it by yourself. And maybe the Lord says that you need to get to the other side, but you are not going to make it on your own. For thou hast said in my haste, I'm uh, for I for I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thy eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. We've talked a lot about patience and a lot about trust, and I think David is a solid example of that. But here in this verse, he he admits a very human, very uh, on, honestly very modern idea of what happens when we pray. A lot of the time, he says. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before my eyes. He prayed and there was no answer. And his first assumption was, God's not with me anymore. That very, very relatable emotion. Thank heavens for the next word, nevertheless. <laughs> thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. O love the Lord, all ye his saints... For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. He calls for love. That's, that's different than praise. That's different. He says, O oh, love the Lord. That, that, is, that is the same emotion that you feel for your parents. That for you that are married, the same emotion that you feel for your, for your spouse. But even greater <laughs> because... One thing that your parents and your spouse is unable to do for you that the Lord has done for you if you're saved 
is he's taken a dead soul and rejuvenated it to life and went through a lot of pain and suffering and anguish to make that so. So for the Lord preserveth the faithful, there's trust again, and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Now this proud, you can say, well, the Bible says not you shouldn't be proud. And it does. But this word proud, if you look up in your strongs, what it can mean, it also means an excellent doer. And it's someone who excels, somebody that's just trying to get out there and do what the Lord tells them to do and do it to the best of their ability. There's reward for that. In fact, if you read that verse in that manner, there's a lot in the New Testament about crowns and stuff, and so that's backed up by Scripture that if you go out and you do things, the Lord, the Lord looks down and says, uh, you, you, you've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Be of good courage. That's not just, it, it, cur- courageousness is not fearlessness. There, there's two different things. Being courageous is willing to do a thing despite being scared about it and doing so with gusto. A courageous person in the middle of a battle runs forward and plants a flag and says, this is our place. A courageous person goes to maybe somebody that is deemed unreachable by other Christians and says, do you know who our Lord is? A courageous person says, all right, well, um, I guess I'm off to whatever foreign land and and, or or even within the United States. You know, if I moved to California, that'd be a pretty foreign land to me. You know, just 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 up and say, yeah, I'm going to follow the Lord and we're gone takes courage. But what is the reciprocation? And, and, and I love passages of Scripture that offer something that the Lord gives you in turn for something that you give Him. You give Him courage, and He will offer strength. He will, it, for, for every bit of you know, crazy thing, you know, crazy stepping out on the water like Peter that you do, He will offer strength to stay above the waves. It's a reciprocal relationship. All ye that hope in the Lord. David, there's no pro, David had no promise that the Lord would deliver him. He had a lot of evidence that he would. He had a lot of past experiences that would say that the Lord... But when we pray, we, there's a little bit of faith. There's a little bit of hope there that the Lord will do what he can... That he, the Lord will do what he that he said to because our Lord, despite what we and, and I like to lay claim to a lot of lot of things in the Scripture that offer um, reciprocal relationships between our Lord between the things that we do for our Lord and what He can do for us, but there are a lot of things that He is not required to do for you. He is not required to heal your body. He is not required to make sure that you have six figures in your bank account. He is not required to even make sure that you have plenty of food on your table. Our Lord and Savior, the God of the universe, who pro- who could have had any and everything at His disposal, walked this earth with not even the simple amount of shelter that animals were granted. You're not promised nothing. And so... When we pray, we lean on faith and trust and hope and, 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 and look forward to our Lord doing something miraculous. And, and, and maybe even like David, made the claim, don't let us be ashamed. We're, 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 we're going to throw this all at your feet and don't let us look stupid in front of our enemies. <laughs> don't, let us look, don't, don't let us look silly for relying on you to, 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 to do the thing you want to do. Don't let us march around the walls of Jericho to at the end of seven days just... Look up and say, well, they're still there, you know. (laughs) Any questions or comments about uh, Psalm chapter 31? If there are none, you are dismissed. Have a good week. Thank you.